Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Blake Bauckham and I'm the Director of Sales for Osteogenics. Before we get started, let me address how we will be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to hear from you and be able to answer any questions that you may have. There's a question and answer button on the right hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time and we will try to get them answered during today's webinar. Now let me introduce you to my friend, uh, Mel Vroom. Dr. Melvroom received his DDS from the Academic Center for Dentistry in Amsterdam in 1994. He also attended their Master of Science program in periodontology from 1995 to 1998. Since then, he has maintained a private practice in the Netherlands, which is limited periodontics and implantology. Dr. Vroom is a national and international speaker on DPTFE membranes and has spoken at the Osteogenic Symposium, the AAP, and the Osteo Osteology Symposium. That's just to name a few of his accomplishments. He also gives multiple hands-on courses during the year and is a general secretary for the Dutch Society of Periodontology. Dr. Vroom, my friend, thank you so much for being here today. Can't wait to hear your lecture and, and be able to interact with you after. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to start with this presentation, I, I look back. I look back at the 14 years I've been uh, using this uh, DPTFE membrane enriched preservation uh, procedures. And when I look back, uh, three words come to my mind. Fascinating, predictable, and joy. And in this presentation, I will come back to these three words and you will see they are related to this technique, which I'm going to present. Uh, today. Let's see if I can have the next slide. Yeah. Blake already told you a little bit about my background. So in 1998, I started to work in uh, the north of the Netherlands together with my colleague Lodewijk Grundeman, who is seen on the upper right. And what I'm showing to, to the, to, today are our clinical cases, our opinion, and to be totally uh, clear, we don't have uh, financial shares in the company who produces this uh, product. Well, let's get back to the GBR basics. And when I think of the GBR basics, I think of the study of Dalin in uh, 1988. An experiment, an animal experiment in which they created surgical defects. So first they lift up the tissues, they create a surgical defect, and then in the test group, they apply a, a PTFE membrane and cover the, the, the defect. While in the control, they used no membrane at all. And in both groups, they again close the tissues at the end. And what they noticed or what they found is that if you, let me see. If you go uh, and see at the membrane site, you see almost complete uh, defect uh, bone fill. While in the control group, there's a limited uh, bone fill due to the connective tissue in growth. So as long as you have a space secured, you will get this regeneration. And a few years later, a very interesting study came up from Professor Schenk, also an animal experiment in which they also created surgical defects. So again, they lift up, open up the tissues, they create the defect and cover it with the membrane in the test group. And in the control, no membrane. And of course, it won't surprise you that in the membrane group, they almost got complete bone regeneration. And again, in the non-covered membrane group, uh, so no membrane use, there was limited bone growth. But also in this study, they used titanium reinforced membranes. And they uh, were shown to keep their uh, shape in a more reliable form. But this study, also shows or tells us what goes on underneath such a membrane, the healing phases. 
And Schenk describes phases from blood clot to woven bone primaria spongiosa, and then to lamellar bone and bone remodeling and the formation of osteons. All those steps to occur. And about uh, uh, three years later, let me see if I can the next slide. Yeah, three years later, Professor Lang in 1997 refers to the study of uh, Professor Schenk, stating that this histological documentation, so the Schenk study, confirmed that bone regeneration in membrane protected defects followed closely the pattern of normal intramembranous bone growth in extraction sites. So he made the similarity of a covered extraction socket. So let's keep that image in mind, a covered extraction socket. And also he states that the development through similar sequence of maturation steps occur. And what do we know about the well-known first PTFE membrane, the E, the expanded PTFE membrane from the well-known Gorg text company who knew? Is it permeable to bacteria? Well, a study which gives an answer to that question is of Simeon in 1994. It's a human study. 10 patients are included and group A, I call it the conservative treatment. So five patients, extraction, then they let the tissues heal for 30 to 40 days, and then they placed an implant and covered it with an E expanded PTFE membrane, and they had primary closure. And after healing, the second phase was done after three to six months. While in group B, five patients were included, it was more the test group, they did extraction, but immediately placed the implant and covered it with an EPTFE membrane. And of course, they had an exposure of this membrane. And the membrane was removed after 30 to 45 days, and then they let the tissues heal. And after three to six months, the second phase was done. And they looked at membrane characteristics and also the amount of regenerated bone which could be achieved. What did they found? They report that in group A, so you kept the tissues closed over the membrane, you have a lot of regeneration, 96%. While in group B, where you had the exposure, it was reduced considerably to 41%. And at the moment, they removed the membrane in group B. They also looked on the membrane on both sides, and they found on both sides uh, large amounts of bacteria. So it's really showing that the bacteria can migrate through the older expanded PTFE membrane. And also they state that exposure is a complication which can reduce the amount of regeneration. All things we found out in those early days of GBR. And of course, a lot of attention went from that time point to the resorbable membranes, due to various reasons. But I will say in the background, the evolution of the PTFE membranes went on. From the upper left, the expanded EPTFE membrane, to 1994, a TEFGEN, more dense version, and in 1997, the cytoplast, dense PTFE membrane, and one year later, the titanium reinforced version. But what's the main advantage of this dense DPTFE membrane? The main advantage over the older, well known in the past, EPTFE membrane. Well, the D, the dense PTFE, proved to be non-permeable to bacteria. And here on the left in the screen, you see a detail of the upper surface of this membrane with dimples in it, which calls the Regentex surface, which will stabilize the membrane as the tissues can adhere in a sort of way to it. And on the right side of your screen, 
you see fibroblasts growing over this membrane, showing that it's really well accepted by the tissues. Not really surprisingly, because of course, PTFE has been used in general medicine for more than over 30 years. But today we're talking about ridge preservation. Why should we do or apply ridge preservation? Well, we all know the sites or the clinical views in daily practice. Here on the right, you see a tooth is extracted and we see a vertical loss. While on the left of your screen, you see a more collapse of the tissues in horizontal direction, direction but also a shift from the mucogingival line from vestibular side to the more lingual side. And if we look at reviews, this is of course backed up with literature, like the review from Hamerle in 2012, a systematic review, and they looked after extraction, just plain extraction, after six months, what kind of mean resorption you can expect. When well, vertical direction is 1.2, and the horizontal direction is more, it's 3.8. And Schropp shows in 2003 that after one year, you will have horizontal uh, resorption about 50%. Let's have a look at some years ago. Around 2010, 2011, a whole bunch of reviews came out. And I just want to highlight one from a Dutch periodontist, Den Hegler. In this review, she looks at various techniques for ridge preservation, but she uses a criterion that each study should have a control group. And the various techniques show various results. However, if we look at the discussion, she states that implant placement would most likely still need additional augmentation because none of the therapies completely prevented bone resorption. And then I start thinking, isn't that odd? I mean, we're applying a technique to, to build up the ridge, or preserve, and still we have to do additional augmentation. Doesn't make sense. Well, the nice thing of having a referring practice, you see all sorts of patients walking in. A patient, for example, like this. And uh, ridge preservation has been applied. The dentist placed the implant, but still we see a massive collapse of the tissues. So does every rich preservation leads to the same results? We can wonder. But what about then the DPTFE rich preservation technique? Well, already in 2001, Dr. Barry Barty described this technique, calling it the cytoplast DPTFE rich preservation technique. And if we look on the left, I think we see a covered extraction socket. Keep that still in mind, so we know what the healing will be underneath it. More than 20 years ago, he has described this technique, and I think it's still remarkable how little attention has been paid to various congresses to this very interesting technique over time. So, what about this technique? First, I'll describe it very briefly, and later on I'll show more details. But very briefly, you extract the tooth as gently as possible, you lift the tissues up around the uh, socket, so you tunneling in a way. Then you uh, trim your uh, DPTFE membrane and you tuck it under, under the tissues. And of course, on the drawing, it always looks easy, but take time, get trained in it. You place the implant and make sure that the edges are covered. So details are important. Then after four weeks, you can take it out because we know from research that the osteoid matrix has formed. And then the epithelialization can uh, go on. And about four to five months after 
uh, you uh, extracted the tooth, you can place your implant. But when we give courses, my colleague and myself, or uh, presentations, we start noticing afterwards that participants easily mix up the indications of this membrane. So that's why we start using the term closed GBR on the left screen, and on the right, the open between quotation marks, uh, open GBR. So meaning that on the left, the closed is the traditional, tooth is already taken out some time before and you have to restore the defect so you apply the membrane but you close the tissues afterwards while on the right with the open gbr immediately after extraction you cover the extraction socket with this membrane and we apply mostly a graft in the socket so you leave it open as a kind of yeah, stable scaffold, you, you can place it in. So how did we run into this uh, membrane, my colleague Lodewijk Grunemann and myself? Well, I think it was 2008 and we went to an uh, implant congress in Europe. And we picked up a, a leaflet from the osteogenics company or the, with the booth. And in the plane back, we looked at this leaflet and we saw a case of Dr. Barry Barty extracting a tooth and then uh, covering the extraction socket, but leaving the membrane open. And we really looked at each other, my colleague and myself, and we were wondering, what is this guy doing? He's leaving the membrane exposed, something from our point of view, very uncommon because we all knew and were trained that with the older, the expanded EPTFE membrane, if you got an exposure, you were in deep trouble. But we got interested and we start ordering this membrane and treated first small cases. Cases like this, tooth taken out, membrane placed, and here you see the clinical view after four weeks. And the tissues really look at ease. There's a little bit plug on the membrane, but that doesn't matter. As we know, it's not, it's uh, non permeable to bacteria. At that time, four weeks after extraction, we can take out the membrane. A nice property is from the membrane that it doesn't easily tear. It, it, it tears, it, it stretches more. But if you want to take it out, you will feel that the tissues will have some grip on the Regentech surface. So you have to apply a little bit of force. Don't be surprised with that. But does it make sense? Does it make sense to use this membrane after an extraction? Well, a study by Hoffman in 2008, I think, gives good answers. By the way, it's a study which is not included in the review of Ten Hechler as it has no control group, but still it's worth looking at. They include 276 extraction sockets. I think that's a good amount. They applied the DPTFE membrane with no reinforcement and no bone filler. And they looked at the bone loss after 12 months. And they excluded teeth with more than 50% bone loss and the membranes were removed 28 days after extraction. And what do they report? Horizontally, hardly any loss, 0 to 0 0.5. On the vertical sides, they lose some, but mainly in the center, which makes sense as it, they didn't use a bone graft and not a reinforced uh, membrane. So it's the part where it's least supported. When we apply this technique in our technique, we saw a very positive effect of the amount of keratinized tissue. Because on the left, you see the image when you just take out the membrane, the osteoid matrix you will see. And then we know the epithelialization will go on. And because the edges are keratinized tissue, it will increase the keratinized tissue. And so in 2014, we were really happy that Barbosa came up with a study which backed up this observation from us. And Barbosa included as a control 15 plain extraction sockets, 
Well, in the test, they uh, did uh, 15 extracted sockets and covered it with a DPTFE membrane, non-reinforced and also no filler. And they looked at the keratinized tissue uh, in horizontal direction. Baseline versus 90 days, and removal again after 28 days after extraction. And what did they report? An increase in the control group, so the plain extraction, a mean of 1.4. But if we look at the test group, there was a larger increase, 6.6, .6, something we also noticed that you have a really good increase of keratinized tissue. And as I often say, you get a luxury amount of it. But giving presentations also pops up the question, what about the barrier function? Not surprisingly, because we all were trained or had the experience with the older expanded PTFE that it, when it is exposed, you were, were really, really in deep trouble. So people have to get used that this dense PTFE can be exposed. And then I always show the study of Laurito. Laurito in 2060, 10 patients, the DPTFE rich preservation technique. And at 28 days, they removed the membrane and looked immediately at the tissue underneath the membrane and investigate this. And they report no epithelial cells or no bacterial contamination. So the barrier function works as long as I always say, as long as the edges are covered, of course. That's a detail which I'll emphasize later on. So what about indications? Well, I think there are various. Of course, conditions which have to be met is that the tissue should cover the membrane edges. No root embrasure, because then you don't have tissue to cover the membrane. And also you don't have enough support as the, from the membrane when you place it. And I think you can wonder if the original rich, rich width is six millimeter or less, does it make sense to apply this technique? But as we were applying this technique, we saw such a nice results that we moved on to more challenging cases, which I want to show to you to really uh, yeah, illustrate the potential of this interesting technique. For example, a patient like this. I treated this patient more than a decade ago. Two molars which have to be extracted. The first molar, the patient wanted an implant. And on the right of your screen, you see the cone beam details and you see a lot of bone loss due apical surgery. So we decided to Extract the both molars. In the first molar, apply a bone graft and also a titanium reinforced DPTFE membrane because we wanted to have as much support as possible. In the second molar, we only place a collagen sponge. After six weeks, I left it in longer to have more support because there was so much bone damage. On the left, you see the clinical image, you see the uh, titanium reinforced strip in the middle of the memory, take out the membrane. We have a little bit bleeding, but that easily stops. And at those times, we, we really wanted to show what, or really find out what um, amount of uh, material was regenerated. So that's why we took a local cone beam. And on the left, pre-extraction, and on the right, you see about five months after extraction, and you see the repair. And we also wanted to know where the floor of the sinus was. So we could place the implant, the upper left, the, the referring dentist made the crown and the x-ray you see after crown placement. And the one which pops up now on the right is the x-ray four years later. And if we have a look at the clinical view, we see on the left upper and lower crown placement, and on the right, upper and right lower, you see uh, the crown after four years. And of course, you see the wear. But let's look at details. 
these three slides I really like. I tell you why, because it's linking science with daily practice. That's what I really like. On the left side of your screen, you see the second molar at six weeks and the tissues are already collapsing. We know from the review of Hamerle that it will continue. On the right, you see the membrane is just taken out and all the borders are keratinized tissue. So all the tissue, which is now reddish, the osteoid matrix, will become uh, keratinized tissue, as we know from the Barbosa study. And from literature, we know that if you take out the tooth, a whole cascade of healing events is going to occur. As, as you think about a kind of natural regeneration wave. Well, why not apply the bone graft, apply this uh, dense TPTF, PTFE membrane, titanium reinforced, and in that way, serving along this regeneration wave and using the membrane as a stable scaffold, really, guiding this wave in the direction we want. And look at this case more in detail. Is it rich preservation? I don't think so. I think you call it rich preservation, slash restoration, and improving the amount of keratinized tissue. Because that's what this technique delivers time after time. And we go back. We go back to this clinical slide. Look at the second molar on the left. Crown placement already reduced and after four years even more reduced. And then look at the tissue at the first molar where we apply this technique and they are stable or white. A joy to look at. Now we go into details. I show you some techniques or just yeah things to to look at first if we extract the tooth we want to make sure that all around we have carrot we have tissue to cover the membrane then we can take a surgical spoon a Lucas spoon and we start making the envelope the tunneling and make sure that you tunnel it very deeply because then you really have space to place your membrane here also take care that if you make the envelope, also really do use the corners like seen here. Make enough space for your membrane. And while you're doing this, you can also feel where the bone loss is not or not. Then you take an Orban knife and you cut under the papilla and you check if you can lift the papilla up because you should have space for the membrane. And also on the other side, you can use this. This instrument you can also use for the corners because sometimes with the Lucas spoon it's difficult to make the right angulation. Then we have three options. First, we have the 12 by 24, non reinforced. And you see here the upper part of dimples, which should move up because face up because they uh, adhere to the tissues. And here we have the 12 by 24 with a titanium reinforced strip of about 10 millimeters. But if you have severely resorbed sockets, it won't do the job. So that's why we were really happy that Osteogenics made this uh, size for us, the 12 by 30. And as you can see, the, the titanium strip is longer. It's about 80 millimeters, so it will do the job in severely resorbed sockets as we use it often. If you start working with this technique, you can, of course, with the paper, first make a mallet when you cut the membrane to the right size. But you can also directly cut it. And then you're going to have a look and see now it's too tight. There is not enough space. So first, I always start cutting a point, a kind of point shape from both sides to get it easier in, in the deeper part. Then we check again and it's too tight so we cut away a very little from the uh, edge of the membrane take it easy and take your time for it this is still too tight because you should be able to place it underneath the papilla 
So that's a real detail you have to take care of. Here, this is better. You can move it a little bit and still it can be covered with both uh, uh, papilla. Now we're gonna check. We see 10 millimeters occlusal. On the palatal, we have a bone up around uh, five or four. So we have a four millimeter on the palatal. We want the occlusal part to be 10. We see 10. We measure 10 and then we're gonna bend it with a surgical tweezer. And make sure that you really bend it in a 90 degrees angle. So you really, what I call a kind of square U-form shape to have a really stable scaffold. If you're done with this, you bend it open a little bit so you will be able to place one side of the membrane and later on the bone graft. There's various techniques, but I'll just show you a couple. Then you take your surgical tweezers and you place it in the envelope which you made with the tunneling procedure. You place it in and then you're gonna check. Check if the membrane is really uh, past the border, the bony border. And if you're sure you are, you can take the tweezer again and place it really deep. So you have stability of this membrane before you place the bone graft. And now we're gonna apply the bone graft. We use always an adjusted uh, 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 yeah, syringe where we put in the bone. So you really can easily place it and have control. Normally, it's of course bleeding. I always use a cotton uh, of, uh, gauze to really get rid of the excess of bleeding and you can see where the bone material is. And then you condense it with the Lucas spoon, but take care not to overfill it. So always fill it up to where the original uh, rich borders uh, were. Now we're going to take a surgical tweezer and we're going to place it under the palatal envelope and you push it with an, uh, an instrument down and because it has a kind of memory it will go to the square u-form shape. And now the difficult part comes because here you can see you have to lift up the papilla over the membrane and this is a really detail you can use the mini me from Istron Urban for this is a really nice instrument and you can really push it underneath and then push again on the edges to really get the U-form shape in it. And because this is a very important detail, I will show it again, this part. As you can see, we place it in. We use the instrument to push it down. And on one side, you see on the mesial side, it's already easily under the papilla, but on the mesial side of the molar, we have to push down the membrane a little bit. And because it's more rigid than the non-reinforced one, it, it bounces back underneath the papilla. And that's really handy of this uh, uh, membrane. Again, push in the square U-form shape that is really stable. And if you look at the membrane now and you push on it, you can already see even on this model, it's quite stable but the edges should be covered. If you have a large bony defect, you can make a small flap. For example, here on the vestibular side, and then you can raise the, the tissues, make a mini flap, and then you can also have more access for cleaning and also for applying the membrane. But there are different options, I just show some. Another technique which you can use to really get in the membrane into this envelope is a kind of retraction suture, as I call it. So first you go from the pellet to the inside and you, your entrance point should be quite apically. Then you pick up the membrane and you go from the, insi from the, out uh, the inside to the outside. Yeah. You go back to the palatal tissue and really again very apical region, get the needle out. Then you're gonna take your needle, he he needle holder and you uh, get, get, get grip of both sutures. 
and you can pull in gently or your assistant can do that. And here you see with the surgical tweezers, you can get it in and pull it in into the deeper part if you want to. What about suturing? Well, we often use a horizontal mattress suture, as you've seen here, to cover the, the membrane and to keep it also in place. And we use it with a sling, as you can see here. And now the difficult part becomes when you start using this material, this technique. Do not, I repeat, do not close the tissues. And that's hard because we're all trained to really start pulling and getting more closed. And in the beginning, it's a little bit yeah, scary. Can I leave it open, the membrane? Yes, you can. Just very little tension to it because else you move up the mucogingival line. Sutures can be removed after uh, uh, two weeks or four weeks. Uh, the membrane is removed four weeks after extraction and with the larger uh, severely resorbed cases, I would advise six weeks. And with this titanium reinforced version, if you use this, you can lift it up a little. You have to get grip of it and then you can stitch, stick the periodontal probe through the membrane underneath the titanium bar or strip. And then it's very easy to pull it out. And mostly you don't need anesthesia for the patient. And you lift it out. And because we were uh, having such a nice result with also the severely resorbed cases, we wanted to report on this. And that's why we conducted a pilot case series study, uh, which I conducted with Lodewijk Grundemann and Is van Urban. And we included really severe cases because most studies exclude 50% bone loss of more. And as far as our knowledge goes, studies which have been done on rich preservation with DPTFE membranes, it, this is the first one to uh, report on titanium reinforced version. 10 patients were included extraction of a premolar or molar, 50% or more buccal loss or palatal and or. So the really bad cases with or without periapical pathology, clinical attachment at the neighboring teeth was accepted and four patients had a fistula. How did we treat these cases? We applied a mixture of allograft 60% and DBBM 40. We applied the 12 by 30 uh, DPTFE membrane, open GBR fashion. Membrane removal was after four to six weeks. And the baseline was just before extraction, so T0. And T1 was before implant placement. And we looked at various scale uh, parameters like uh, probing pocket depth, uh, keratinized tissue, uh, to name a few, but also bone changes, which we measured clinically. Uh, but also at T1, we looked at the horizontal bone loss by doing uh, bone sounding, uh, transferring these measurements to a stone cast model, which was made at T1. And this stone cast model was scanned and stitched to the baseline cone beam. So we we're really measuring where the heart regenerated tissue was. Here are some patients, patient from the study, patient with a first molar has to be taken out, already a recession. If we look at the cone beam scan before extraction, you can see that uh, the buccal, bow, buccal wall is nearly totally blown out. We apply this technique and on the left, you see after extraction, the membrane, we take out the membrane after four or six weeks. And then after around five months, we can place the implant, which you see on the right. We have restored the bone. And clinically, we also got rid of the recession. Or another patient from this study with a lot of decay and also bone loss on the buccal side. Here we see the clinical view, a cleft already, clinical attachment level on the neighboring teeth, 
not a very tempting, uh, not a very positive uh, sight, but still it's tempting. So we take out the tooth carefully. You see the bone loss here on the buccal side. You apply this technique and after five months, the fun part can really begin. We have a luxury amount of keratinized tissue, wonderful. We go and open up the tissue and the joy is even more because we have fantastic bone. And I often say, now we're going to do the real test of the regenerated material. We're going to drill in it. And we have been using other techniques, but never you get the hardness of bone which you get with this technique. As you can see the next slide, really hard bone, sharp edges. It shows it. So what about the results of this pilot study? The mean bone changes in horizontal direction, direction were minus 0.8. While in vertical we gained 0.2 to 2.8 millimeters, depending on the site. And the highest vertical bone gain of course, again, depending on the site, was 2.5 to 5.7. Character's tissue increased, so it confirmed the Barbosa study, and we have good uh, implant stability quotums. One patient needed an additional augmentation at the implant placement, but it was more due to an anatomical uh, undercut in the ridge, which was present pre-extraction. If we look at other cases to show the, the, the potential, this is a patient not included in the study, was treated long before, but it showed that if you have an incisor with a lot of bone loss, uh, no buccal wall do apical surgery, etc. And uh, this patient was, by the way, smoking 10 cigarettes a day. But with the normal 12 by 24 titanium, we couldn't have done the job. So this is a real case for this ANL30. As I showed earlier, we uh, said earlier, we were really happy that the company made this. And the company called this the ANL30. And of course, you will agree that uh, my colleague and myself said the A is for the advanced cases and the NL stands, of course, for the Netherlands. But I'm not sure if Blake will agree on that. We'll see. <laughs> anyway. The same patient, at five months, we could place the implant. And here we see the final result. But now we go to even worse cases. Cases you already recognize from your practice. You will probably recognize this. You take out a very weak molar tooth. It breaks off. Roots are remaining. You have to lift the flap and remove bone because you want to have access to uh, the remaining roots to get them out. And while you're drilling away the bone around these roots, probably you also have noticed there's a little voice in the back of your mind saying, I don't like this really. I am moving away the bone, which I have to restore later on. Probably a familiar feeling, you, your thought. Well, to be sure, to be frank, I've lost that feeling already more than a decade ago because with such a case, I can restore it. And after five months, if I'm opening up, I have wonderful bone. I have a luxury amount of keratinized tissue. And again, the word joy pops up. But maybe you're wondering, he's raising a flap. Well, in some reviews, they say you should not raise a flap because it has a negative influence on the buccal bone plate. Well, then have a look at the following study from Chesnoe Mate, an animal study in which they treated the extraction sockets with a DPTFE membrane and in a control group, no membrane. And they took out after 40 days this membrane because it was an animal experiment and they found that on the covered, uh, if they, yeah, they sacrificed the, the, the animals at eight weeks, if I'm correct. And they saw that the bone growth was outside the buccal plate when you apply this membrane. And this observation was also uh, uh, confirmed by a study in 2019 
by Pessoa, Pessoa de Oliveira, which uh, did also this uh, study model, but closed the tissues to have more control of the membrane. So it shows that if you raise a flap with this technique, you can still have good results. And now pushing the limits even more. Look at this case. Bone away nearly everywhere. But we believe in this technique and we saw so many nice results. So we apply this technique and after five or six months you have the bone and you can place your implant. In our practice, of course, besides the open GBR directly after extraction, we also apply a closed GBR, meaning the tooth is already taken out long ago. And if you apply the closed GBR, from time to time you will get an exposure. But because we got the experience with the open GBR, we start looking differently at the uh, exposures when they occurred in the closed GBR. And we also looked at classifications, how to deal with them. And most of these classifications were based on the older E, the expanded PTFE membrane, or were not uh, complete as we, uh, to our opinion. So that's why uh, last year uh, a classification was published, uh, which I uh, together published with Lodewijk Grunemann and Pierre Gallo which will guide you how to deal with it, but probably this can be an interesting subject for another webinar. If we're gonna look at uh, reviews, more recent reviews, I want to draw your attention to, uh, I think it's a very interesting study by uh, Barocci uh, from last year. And they only include non-molars with less than 50% buccal bone loss. And in this review, they state as uh, implications for daily practice that avoid flap advancements for healing by primary attention. So really it emphasizes the need not to close and uh, close the tissues. They also state that consider a membrane as it will um, minimize the rich uh, resorption. And they say above 50 US dollars, there's a diminishing effect. Well, they asked for these prices, of course, two years ago, and you won't be surprised that the cytoplast DPTFE membrane without reinforcement at that time was 50 US dollars. So it really shows in this review that it is a good membrane. And if you read a lot and, and also look at all those reviews, you get also sometimes uh, personal uh, considerations, which I like to share. Considerations like what's the uniformity, uniformity of sockets? I mean, if you have a resorbed socket, the, every socket has its unique uh, characteristics. So it's difficult, I think, a subject to study. And I also wonder hardness of the regenerated tissue versus rich measurements. I mean, some studies are measuring on cone beams, but it doesn't say anything about hardness. That's what I like of this review by Barucci, that they also mentioned some studies which uh, report that the regenerated uh, tissue is rather soft, which you can have with other techniques from my point of view. And an interesting point of course is what's the effect of the titanium reinforcement? Uh, if you compare it with the non-reinforced, we don't know. I mean, this pilot study as far as our knowledge goes, is the first one with the titanium reinforced, uh, using it in the rich preservation. But with all techniques, to be clear, and I want to show a really honest image or picture, you have, you have a con chance of complications. Complications with this DPTV after extraction, I will call exfoliation or partially exfoliation of the membrane. Infection is sometimes measured, mes mentioned, but if I look back at the 40 years, we only had one patient with an infection. And if I look at the Hoffman study and also another study of Barbosa 
I came up with more than 600 patients with this technique and no infection. But an example, patient treated here on the left after extraction membrane in place. On the right, two weeks after extraction, we took out the sutures. Nowadays, I take them out uh, later. But then another two weeks later, so four weeks after extraction, we see the exfoliation of the membrane. But then can you really call it a complication? I mean, you take out the membrane and then after four months, you still have the luxury amount of keratinized tissue and you can place your implant. And on the right, you see the implant crown after uh, three years in place. But take care, take care that if you use the titanium reinforced membrane, which we liked, as I said, it's, it's easier to get it under the papilla because the papilla really should cover the edges. Make sure that you bend it in a really U-form square size and also uh, mimic the, the sizes of the, 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 the ridge which you want to restore and which it was originally. You can't overbuild too much outside the original form. And on the right, you see that you really make the edges deep enough that they really pass the existing borders. So uh, make it uh, preferably uh, longer, that is really stuck under the tissues quite deep to have this stability and to minimize the chance of that it will exfoliate. So I come to conclusions, if it will work. Conclusions, supported by literature. It makes implant placement much easier. A nice story to tell is that in the Netherlands, once a participant of uh, uh, hands-on came later on to me, a few years later, he said, thank you. I said, why? He said, thank you for showing me this technique. It made implant placement so much easier. It's indicated for all sorts of sockets, as I illustrated, with really worst cases to treat. And it will prevent a large sinus lift in the upper jaw or more complex GBR procedures down the road because you're restoring after extraction. It will increase the keratinized tissue. That's a very nice side effect. But also, I think a detail which should be uh, emphasized, you get no shift of the mucogingival line. And there's hardly any need for additional augmentation at the implant placement. If we look back at the 14 years, we, we looked at it and we came out about 6%. But all the membrane, uh, in all those situations, still the membrane, when we placed it, it was covered by bone. So I started with three words, fascinating, predictable, and joy. And those words have been illustrated in this presentation. So if I put it all together, I think this is a rather fascinating technique, which I'm sure will bring you a lot of joy in your daily practice. I thank you for your attention. Dr. Groom, I agree. Fascinating presentation with a ton of really good information and lots of clinical pearls that I'm sure our attendees and, and the audience will be able to use in their daily practice. So thank you so much for sharing your presentation. Okay. We've had some really good questions that have come in already, uh, but I want to remind everybody the question and answer button there is on the right hand side of your screen. So please, if you have additional questions, please feel free to type those in. We'll get to as many as we can here. Looks like we've got oh, five or 10 minutes that we can we can spend here uh, with Dr. Groom. Of course, it's late in the Netherlands, so we appreciate you taking the time to, to do this for us here. But let me get into the questions. Um, the first one is written from the perspective of the clinician. So let me just uh, pretend like I'm a doctor, which I'm not. But when I have a buccal bone defect or the bone be defect due to fistula, I was taught to use resorbable collagen membrane and then to cover that defect. And then I also use a, a PTFE membrane over the top of the collagen membrane. So what are your thoughts on that technique when we have a buccal defect or a fistula? Yeah. 
Well, what I show is that in the pilot study, uh, we include uh, patients with more than 50% bone loss, Bellator, Bucor, or both walls. So there was massive bone loss and for patients at the fistula. And what I noticed that uh, when you uh, clean it properly, place the implant properly, you have a very stable scaffold which will seal it off. And then when you take out the membrane with the advanced cases, of course, after six weeks, there's no fistula. I always like to, to, to keep the, the material cost for the patients as low as possible. Uh, and of course, it's an investment, the cost at a rich preservation. But as we hardly need any additional augmentation when we place the implant, the, the, the costs are, are reasonable. But if you're going to apply a, a, a collagen membrane, I won't do. Uh, I, I, I don't see any point in it. And that's why I think to this participant, uh, read the, the, the pilot study and, and see for yourself. It's now in the International Journal of Perio-Restorative Dentistry, May, June. You can have a look at it. Great. Very good answer. So the, sh the next question then, do studies show better regeneration if surgical tacks and PTFE sutures are used, or is it okay just to use the sutures without fixating the membrane? Yeah, the, the, the nice thing is when you use a titanium reinforced membrane, uh, besides from the easier placement with the papilla, because it's more rigid, it doesn't rimple so easily, which you will get with the non reinforced. Uh, and if you use the technique which I showed you with the square U form, as I always mention, I call it, um, it's so stable. And you won't be surprised if you place it in. And you push on it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really strong scaffold. It's wonderful. And you have your, your stable box, which you want. And think it over in the presentation. I mean, you, you, you see the study of Schenk also with, with, you know, what is going on underneath. Uh, yeah, sometimes to patients, I always say that the membrane is a kind of temporary Band-Aid, if I s pronounce it right in English. To, to cover the wound because we are working in, in one of the most dirtiest parts of the, of the body, the mouth, and we're doing a kind of orthopedic surgery. Uh, so really have a good uh, seal. And that's why this, this membrane is so working so well. So suturing the, the membrane, I won't do it. It's, it's not necessary. Okay. Perfect. Great answer again. So just, just to be clear there, as long as you can easily adapt the membrane, it's got enough support from the underlying bone and the bone graft, you really don't think there's a, a need for fixation pins or screws with this type of case. Now, pins, not at all, because then you have to really raise the tissues or lift and make a flap again. So pins, not at all. So that's a no go uh, at all. And I maybe can think of situations when you're using, uh, when you're using a non-reinforced uh, 12 by 24 that you maybe like to suture it for more stability. But probably you are treating challenging cases and then why not switch to the 12 by 30? But we see a lot of examples of patients or uh, colleagues using uh, the 12 by 24 non-reinforced and I hope with this pilot study that they also can see the, the advantages of using a more stable scaffold for better results, but I think also for easier placement. Great, Dr. Vroom, I'll, I'll just tell you the questions now are flying in fast and furious. Lots of questions coming in. Good. We probably aren't gonna get People to all of thinking. them. I'll, 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 yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's good interaction. I'll, I'll probably send some of these questions to you. We can get the answers and then we can respond back to the attendees if you're okay with it. So let me ask yeah, a couple like more that your time's important, but let me, uh, let, let's see here. What's another one? Uh, bone graft material that you use. Are you using allografts, xenografts? What, uh, what material are you using for these cases? Yeah. yeah. Well, as I said, with the pilot study, uh, we used 60% uh, uh, allograft and 40% DBBM and uh, okay. xenograft. And um, our thought behind is that you, you see it as a GBR, but it's in an open GBR fashion. You, you serve along the regeneration wave of the body because you take out the tooth, there's trauma, there's bone growth, of growth factors released, etc. 
and um, um, yeah, that really helps with 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 uh, with uh, with the healing. Uh, I should emphasize that when you extract the tooth, uh, really take care that there is enough bleeding, of course, in the socket because that's the basis of all. And we want to have stability. And if you also see for uh, horizontal or vertical GBR, also uh, the, the xenograph will help for the longer stability. Perfect. Um, let's see here. Are there any undesirable effects when using a removable temporary prosthesis on top of the membrane for these cases? No, as long as it doesn't push on it. Yeah, you have to have complete not, relief. Uh, there yeah. can be no pressure yeah. on, the, on the side, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Elaborate on the pre- and post-op medication uh, and any post-op instructions for these cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, of course, rinsing. Uh, rinsing uh, uh, will do for the first two weeks uh, twice a day, or yeah, maybe the first 10 days twice a day. And then once a day. I don't like the the, the, the brushing with some colleagues in the States do with the Q-tip. I, I don't like the micro movement uh, because I want to have stability. Uh, so they rinse quite quite a long time. And of course, yeah, uh, with the with, uh, um, antibiotics coverage, uh, we are also now uh, looking at uh, uh, local uh, delivery of antibiotics in the graft. But we're we're studying this, so I can't make really final recommendations yet on those topics. Okay, perfect. So I'll get get here to the last question, and and for the audience, if your question wasn't answered, we will try to get an answer from Dr. Room and email you the response there, which would be good to have that kind of direct interaction anyway. But uh, the final question here is: Can we use this technique uh, when when simultaneous implant placement is also occurring? Yeah, I expected that one. <laughs> sure. uh, we, uh, we, we are a little bit conservative in our practice in a way. We're pushing the limits, of course, as you see with these cases. But um, I always like it to have first the bone and, and the tissues and then make the implant placement. But, of course, there, there is a case report on it. And uh, I just uh, looked it up uh, today because I expected this question. There's an interesting study from uh, 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 Gregor George uh, Zaviropoulos, if I correct it uh, rightly. And uh, that's an uh, uh, article from 2020. And it was published in uh, Medicina. But there they show also cases where they're covering up uh, direct implant placement, graft, and then place a membrane on top of it, and they remove it after several weeks. There are indications for it, but I think it also depends on um, uh, if you're more conservative or not. I think it's a good point. From some of our other more conservative colleagues that we work with, you know, the, the kind of the challenge to placing implants simultaneously with this type of graft is if you have any type of complication, it, it becomes much worse whenever you have the implant that's also involved now in the situation. So most yeah. of the time, yeah. and in osteogenics, we're also as, as conservative as we can be. Uh, you know, the, the suggestion probably is to take it easy. Yeah. We can stage that and still yeah. get a good result. There, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. one thing that I want to mention is we will upload this presentation then to our YouTube page and also some social media. So everybody will have access to it there. Um, but that, that really wraps us up. There's, there's of course, several other questions which Dr. Vroom will, will graciously help us answer and we will get that to everybody. Um, one final thing is uh, we will have a survey that we will send out here shortly to get feedback from the attendees and Dr. Vroom will, will provide you the information there. But uh, to kind of wrap us up and close here, I wanna thank you for your time, Dr. Vroom. It's been a fantastic presentation. Your answers to the questions here have also been gracious and we appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with, with us there as we've gone over here a little bit. But overall, just wanna really thank you and, and let you know how much we appreciate all that you're doing here uh, for osteogenics and also for your patients and, and the clinicians that joined us today. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And to all the participants, uh, really consider this interesting technique which doesn't get so much attention at big uh, congresses, but it's, it's great to work with and you will be very, you will be fascinated too. It's every, every time joy if you see the results, yeah.
So enjoy. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Goodbye.